Cadian Blood Prologue The Way a World Dies At first there was silence. People died, but there was no outcry. The bodies rested in noiseless repose in tower habitation spires, in the prayer rooms of great monasteries, in gutters by the sides of the street. The deaths went unnoticed. This was a world that saw ten million new pilgrims each month. It was no stranger to see off-worlders come, only to die soon after. The shrine world of Cather, named for the saint himself, was a beacon of faith and hope for the people of the scarce sector. Faith flared or withered for those who came to see and tread on that holy soil of this blessed world, seeking affirmation for lives lived without meaning. Hope flowered or died for those who landed here seeking to touch the relics of a long-dead saint and be healed of injury or illness. When people began to die, there was no planet-wide panic, no ringing sirens wailing across cities, and no distress calls to nearby worlds crying of a devastating disease. The sickness spread, tearing through the population, but to those who watched for such things, it was just a spike in the numbers. These things happened from time to time. Simply a plague brought from off-world, the world's leaders said. Faith will scourge the taint from the righteous and pure. No warnings. No panic. Silence. The silence did not last long. At the dawn of the outbreak's second week, there were too many dead for the funeral priest to haul into the consecrated incinerators, and the ecclesiarchy governors realized their planet was suffering no natural plague. The death toll was catastrophic, and the Cathari acolytes traditionally tasked with funerary rites walked the streets in gangs, losing the battle to do their simple duty. The initial astropathic cries for help reached out from Cathar. Several hundred psychers worldwide screaming their pleas into the warp, begging for assistance. Imperial forces in the sector responded to the cries for aid in impressive time. Scarus was forever the archenemy's ripest target, and the Emperor's servants never relaxed their vigilance here. Fleets of ships powered up their engines and broke into the warp, chasing the source of the psychic screams like bloodhounds pursuing the scent of prey. The stream of comm channel messages and psychic transmissions from Cathar told of a plague without end, of millions already dead, of a planet dying. The Imperium was no stranger to the curse of unbelief. Even now, the plague racked dozens of worlds across Segmentum Obscurus, but Cathar was the anomaly, the one world that broke the pattern of infection. The other infected world stood on the rim of the War Master's Black Crusade. Cathar, however, was far from the Great Eye and the systems drowning in the tides of battle. All this death made no sense. There was no spaceship of the arch enemy to spread the taint, no touch of heresy detected among the populace, and no sign of chaos in the planet's rule. But it was the curse. The curse of unbelief ripped across the shrine world now, taking those who lacked true faith in the god emperor. It rotted flesh and turned organs putrescent while the victims still lived. Many turned to suicide rather than decay in agony. Riots broke out over the planet, funeral pyres burning endlessly the streams of black smoke choking the sky around the largest cathedral cities. The Adeptus Hierarchs receiving the first wave of communications from Cather ordered the planet cut off from the Imperium at the first signs of the curse. Assembled in the heavens above the doomed world, a mighty fleet coalesced over the course of several days. They did not come to save the people, they came only to stop the population evacuating. The taint, the fleet captains knew, must never be spread. On the command decks of Imperial Navy vessels stationed in high orbit, stern-faced inquisitors oversaw the blockade's management. No vaccine had ever been found to ease the sufferings of the inflicted. In the words of Inquisitor Caius as he stood on the bridge of the Gothic-class vessel, in his name, We consign these souls to oblivion, for mercy now would damn us all. The blockade of Imperial Navy vessels hung in the reaches above Cather, enforcing the quarantine with lethal vigor. Thousands of the Emperor's citizens died under the anger of Imperial guns as the blockade vessels fired on any ship fleeing the planet. It wasn't long before the attempts ceased. The people on the surface were either too ill to make the journey or already dead. Bizarrely, pilgrims sought to make planet fall still wishing to walk amongst the cathedral cities of the saint's world and receive the blessings of St. Cather. Any attempts by pilgrim vessels to reach the surface were deterred by stern threats and the weapon batteries of Cobra-class destroyers. Such warnings, a barefaced presentation of the Emperor's might were enough for most ships. A single vessel had been filled with souls pious enough to run the blockade. 
This ship, a walling barge little more than a cargo hauler, and packed with 300 pilgrims, ultimately did make it down to the surface of Cather. What remained of the ship after its brief encounter with Imperial Fury fighters flamed through the atmosphere and crashed into the Western Ocean. Inquisitor Bastian Caius of the Order Sepultrum stayed in Vox contact with the Enforcer Marshal of Cather, a man by the name of Banachek, until the very end of Imperial control. The commander of the planet's enforcers remained in touch with the Inquisitor for 17 days, describing the scenes of carnage and plague ravaging the surface as his men tried to retain order. Every word was recorded, each syllable of his rhythmic cant distorted as it was by Vox interference. Through this cackling monotone, Caius learned of the erosion and breakdown of Imperial rule. On the third day of contact, the Marshal reported cults rising among the dwindling Cather Planetary Defense Force, and occultists within being spared the curse's death. The Detacte Imperialis was broken, the Emperor's law abandoned. By this time, the global law enforcement force was already effectively destroyed. It fell to the elite enforcers to take to the streets, slaughtering cultists in a series of brutal raids on hidden strongholds. Despite initial successes, they were doomed to fail. On the sixth day, chanting rose from temples across the planet, no longer in praise of the Emperor, but now pleading to the ruinous powers for mercy. Control across the planet was under threat, with the capital city of Solthane standing out as the final bastion of Imperial Order. The enforcers entered the cathedral districts of Solthane in unprecedented force, leading the shattered remains of still loyal PDF and the still living law enforcement officers. Their objective was to quell the rising cults across the planet in a decisive and damning half-week of fighting. Banachek reported losses amongst his forces of 93% on the morning of the ninth day. The cults' numbers were far greater than had initially been surmised. Those that were not already well armed by the PDF defectors overcame enforcer assault teams by sheer weight of numbers. The marshal produced evidence in both audio and pict form of his men dragged down and eaten by plague victims in some districts and falling under fire from hordes of cultists and others. Caius looked at other gray blurry picks beamed up from the surface by Banachek. Here, an enforcer's team's repressor tank flamed in the street. There a horde of plague victims surrounded a monastery filled with dying citizens. Too many of the dead had not been destroyed. The still-living population were paying for the failure of the funeral priesthood now. On the eleventh day, reports became increasingly choppy and erratic. The swelling cults claimed whole districts of the dying cities, each member saved from death by their new allegiance. Chaos emanations raved the planet, eroding all reliability in astropathic contact and painting all psychically gifted souls aboard the blockade fleet vessels. The ship's navigators and all present inquisitors had a lifetime of training to resist such invasive psychic agony, but they still suffered. The touch of chaos infected many of those without psychic talents. Incidents of homicide and apostasy broke out aboard the destroyer vessels. These were quickly crushed by inquisitor-led purges. Though the Cobra destroyer Terra Spite was lost when the unrest within the ship's bowels led to an explosion in the Engineerium. Three hundred souls lost and the wreckage rained on the cathedral cities below, a storm of fire from the heavens. The Inquisitors ordered the blockade into a higher orbit after the shipboard purges were complete. Cather was now an unholy beacon within the warp, and proximity to the Faunus sweeping the planet was deemed a moral threat to the naval crews. Small clusters of destroyers orbited the planets in shifts, then broke away to allow others their turn. No captain wished to risk his men becoming tainted by the archenemy's emanations rising from the doomed world below. On the seventeenth day, the horde of cursed victims besieging the Enforcer precinct battered down the final barricades, and the handful of still-living black-armored peacekeepers fell. Inquisitor Caius recorded the Enforcer Marshal's final words for Ordo Sepulchrum records. We will stand before the throne, and we will not flinch before his judgment, for we die doing our duty. The Inquisitor could hear the moistness of the man's lips in each word. The Marshal had been dying, coughing up mouthfuls of diseased blood. He finished with a strained, The Emperor protects. In truth, there had been more. But Caius deleted the man's final oaths, cried in agony and the wails of the plague victims in the room. Some stories didn't need to be told. With the blockade in place, there was talk of exterminatus, of bombarding the world from space in the name of the Emperor. Such discussion was quickly quenched. Orbital bombardment would not be sanctioned. The damage to the planet's precious architecture, as well as the loss of so many relics, would be the gravest sin. 
to use virus bombs would destroy all hopes of resettlement for months to come without even guaranteeing the final deaths of the plague victims. To use cyclonic torpedoes would ravage the planet on the tectonic level, blasphemy beyond belief. So, Cather was allowed to die. Preparations were made on worlds elsewhere in the Scarra sector. The talk of outbreaks and quarantines and blockades became plans for an invasion. Weeks passed before these preparations bore fruit, but for all its slowness, the Imperial War Machine was a relentless beast. How did this happen? The question raged through the orbiting fleet, and through the echelons of Imperial rule that were even allowed to become aware of the situation. Nothing made sense. No response seemed without myriad flaws. The Shrine world was precious beyond reckoning, yet had fallen without cause. Elsewhere, under the shadow of the Warmaster's new crusade, all worlds falling to the plague had been besieged, assaulted, or otherwise corrupted by the mass presence of arch-enemy vessels. With Cather, there had been nothing but silence. At last it was decided. Regiments of Imperial Guard were withdrawn from the greater war effort around the Eye of Terror, and assigned as the vanguard to a larger force of conquest. This blasphemy would not be tolerated. This desecration would not be allowed to stand. In the heavens above the Shrine World, a small fleet of hulking ships drew close, falling into a restful orbit. The blockade of destroyers scattered to the warp, leaving their ward in the care of these new arrivals, the troop ships of the Imperial Guard. One other vessel of note broke from warp space and glided into orbit alongside these monumental troop transports, a strike cruiser of the Adeptus Astartes, black as death in the night, bearing the marble, corvid sigil of the Raven Guard. The fleet drew close to the planet, casting colossal shadows as the great ships blocked out the sun on the world below. The Cather reclamation was underway. The Imperium of Man had come to take back its holy world. Among the silent cathedrals and towering monasteries on the surface, the months dead population sensed the presence of the Emperor's servants. They looked up, staring, waiting. As the first troop transports came through the cloud cover, all over the planet a great cry was raised. The voices of fifty million dead men, women, and children rose to the sky in a long and tortured chorus. Now hear this! Words of truth from the Eagle and Bolter! The Cather Reclamation has commenced! The falling regiments of His Most Glorious Majesty's Imperial Guard and supporting forces are committed to retaking the Shrine World from the hated arch enemy. Vendican 12th Rifles, the 303rd Uriah, 25th Caridian Irregulars, the Janus 6th, 3rd Scar and Rangers, the Hadris Rith 40th Armored, and the Cadian 88th Mechanized Infantry, followed alongside by half a company of the Emperor's beloved Raven Guard Astartes chapter. Following them, and up and coming over us all, are the agents of His Divine Majesty's Holy Inquisition, the Ordal Sepultrum. Reports from Lord General McGregg sent directly to the Eagle and Bolter site that the initial troop landings are complete with minimal casualties and all resistance to date utterly destroyed. The main force of the reclamation is due to arrive in several weeks. The 25th Caridian Irregulars are to be commended for their valiant defense last week of a vital communications tower in the capital city of Saltane. The Caridians fought a heroic battle lasting several days, ultimately defeating the diseased dregs of the Cather Planetary Defense Force, the so-called Remnant, assailing their position. Casualties were light. But that's not all, folks! The Janus Six has pressed deep into enemy-held territory, securing a monastery dedicated to the Holy God Emperor! Even as we go to press, they crush all remnants of the PDF that seek to oust their successful beachhead in Sultane. The Cadian 88th Mechanized Infantry, proudly boasting a captain bearing the Ward of Cadian Medal for his valor in the opening engagements of the 13th Black Crusade, is tasked in the coming days to assist the Janusians' defiant infiltration. Forward, the Janus 6th, the Emperor protects!